right, well, this is going to kind of be interesting because I have to, like, I know. <laughs> I'll just do laps in a circle, and we'll get there. Um, but I like this because you all seem close to me. Like, I can see all your faces. You might not know it, but when I stand up there, like, I can't see any of your faces. So this is nice. Um, so obviously, we are doing a more acoustic service. We're trying to make things more casual. So I think the message might be <laughs> more casual. It might not. We'll see. Um, but it's been a long week. Has anyone else had a long week? Yeah? Yeah, because you all just got back from spring break, and, like, the school is hard. Yeah. So we're all kind of feeling the same way anyway, so I think that's good. Um, but another thing is that I haven't been around that long, but I've been around long enough to forget the stories that I've told you and that I haven't told you. So this might not be new, but I hope it is, or it's not. You get to hear it for a second time. Um, as some of you know, I worked at Nelson's Ice Cream in high school. Any nice Nelson's Ice Cream fans? Yes. Yes. There is this, this is totally random, but this summer I went there, and they have this flavor. It's called Barking Pretzel. Has anyone had it? You guys, it's so good. I, yeah, you should try it. I don't really have anything else to say about it. I literally Googled the Kemp's ice cream thing today so I could figure out what the name of it was. Um, it has pretzels in it, and it's like, uh, it's just good. I don't know. I forget what else is in it. You should try it. You guys all like Pirate's Booty or something like that, I'm assuming. No? What do you like? <laughs> chocolate chip, did someone say? Just chocolate. Cookie dough. Yeah, the classics, the classics. Vanilla, did you say? Just a lot of interesting opinions, specifically here tonight. I just, I appreciate it. <laughs> Raspberry sorbet, yep. Um, but uh, at Nelson's, I worked there. Loved it, great time. Loved the speed and the energy, and the tips were good too, <laughs> which is part of the reason I liked it. But I really enjoyed working there. Um, but it was so busy that it would be hard during our shift to um, like do things that you probably should do, like clean the tables and empty the garbage cans, which you've experienced probably if you've been there. And so the only time you could do it was when your shift was ending and the people for the next shift had come in. And I don't know if, like, I wasn't assertive enough or what, but I would usually always end up having to take out the garbage. And they're, like, garbage cans are, like, this tall. Um, and I'm not a big person, and I was even smaller then. And so um, they were overflowing, and I would have to, like, lug it out of the garbage can, which took all the strength I had. But then I would pull it across the parking lot to get it into the dumpster. And so it would take me, like, you know, three little movements, and I would get it balanced, like, the dumpster's, like, this tall. I get it balanced on the dumpster, and then I just have to push it in, which normally worked pretty well. Um, but one day, I had it balanced, like, up here, and the whole thing split, like, the garbage bag split, and cups and melted ice cream that people had eaten just come like pouring out all over me and it's like sandy by the dumpster so like sticky ice cream plus sand like it was a total mess and it was like I still remember that visual of this like overwhelming sort of thing I remember walking back into the um, ice cream shop and I'm like literally bleeding from this experience like I looked like a mess I know I don't know how it happened I think it the, no I think the cups were just sharp or something I'm not sure <laughs> I don't know um now that I think about it, I don't know why I was bleeding, but I was. Um, but th that image brings to mind, like, this feeling I get sometimes, <laughs> which is, like, when you feel the weight of the world on your shoulders, like, you feel like you're a second away from disaster. Like, things feel heavy. There's all these problems around you that are too big for you to control, and you feel like any second now that thing could split, and you could be in a big mess. And... What I think is that we are in a world with a lot of problems. I think you know that. I think I know that. And the challenge can be that the problems of the world can seem so big that it can make us feel helpless. I mean, we are um, right now on everyone's mind. We're, we're thinking about a war that is happening in Ukraine. We're thinking about, like, climate change that we're supposed to do something about, but individually we can't do much, but we need to do something. I mean, on top of all of these other things, we're faced with these problems that feel too big for us to handle. 
Maybe they're not even world problems, although those certainly fit that description. Maybe it's just your own anxiety or depression just feels too big for you to handle. Or there's a family situation that you have with your parents are upset or a problem with a sibling, and it just feels like it's too much for you to handle. And the question is, what do we do when we don't know what to do? What do we do when the problems of the world are out of our control? When we're looking at a situation, whether it is globally or just in our own world, that feels so far beneath our grasp, that feels like this garbage just hanging over our heads, what do we do when we don't know what to do? That's what I want to talk about tonight. Because I think we have two sort of initial responses or temptations, and I don't think either of them are very helpful. Because the first one is that I think sometimes uh, we can almost become obsessive about something. That we can hear about this problem, whether it is global or local, and it can sort of become something we fixate on that we're obsessed with. Like, we all have phones. We know that if you want to, you can be getting a second-by-second update of almost anything that is happening in the world. And so what that can cause us to do is just start that spiral and to be so fixated on it that we can hardly think about anything else. I don't think that's very helpful. But I think the other response is to look at the the problems of the world that feel too big to handle and say, well, I can't do anything about it. I just shouldn't care at all. That we get apathetic. That we think, if I can't do this, this feels like too big. My response is just going to be to not care about anything. And I don't think that is who Jesus calls us to be either. So what do we do when we don't know what to do? So what I want to do with the rest of the time is just get really practical um, and and give you four things. And none of these things are going to be all that surprising. My goal is not to surprise you tonight, but it is to remind you of what is true. Because I think as followers of Jesus, we might feel overwhelmed at times, but we should never feel helpless. And sometimes I think when we look at the state of the world, it can bring up those feelings of helplessness. And so the first thing is this, that we go to God. We go to God. It says this, I have, Jesus is talking to his friends and he says this, I have told you these things so that you may have peace in me. In this world, you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Jesus is telling his followers how he's going to have to suffer and die. And remember, they don't know this, so that feels really scary to them. But he says the reason he's telling you the, him, them these things is so that they may have peace. That God's heart for you is that you would have peace. And it says this, but in this world, you will have trouble. You see, God does not promise us a pain-free, problem-free life. And sometimes if we don't know that, when things can go wrong, they can send us into this spiral of like, this isn't supposed to happen. This isn't supposed to go wrong. But Jesus never promised that. In fact, he knows what I think you and I know. We talked about it a few months ago, that this world is affected by people who make decisions that dishonor the way that God is calling them to live and and aren't loving towards one another. And that creates problems in the world. Maybe if it's just your friend that's doing that, that can create a problem that's in your friend group. But we also know that when people who are powerful make those decisions, that can affect a whole bunch of people. And so Jesus is saying that's going to keep happening because people are going to keep making those decisions. In this world, you will have trouble. But you can have peace because you can know that I have overcome the world. Jesus says, I am bigger than the world. There's this passage of scripture in Colossians, and it talks about how it like, goes on and on and on. It talks about how Jesus created the world, and everything was created through him and for him. He holds it all together, that he's supreme, that he has authority above it all. And the whole point of this like, big, long chapter of scripture is supposed to tell you, hey, God's really big, and God is really powerful. He's really big, and he's really powerful. Because sometimes we we say, hey, Jesus wants to have a relationship with you. He wants to be your friend. And that's true. But don't forget how powerful God is. That like the song says, he holds the whole world in his hands. God is not overwhelmed by anything. There is no problem that is not bigger than he is. 
And so the invitation is to go to that God, that big God who has so much more power than you do. Because I think sometimes our temptation is just to turn into ourselves. We, we live in a day where we think we should be able to solve all of our problems ourselves. And sometimes when we can't do that, what we do is we just turn in. We just distract ourselves. Maybe you do that with a relationship or, or just trying to stay busy. Maybe you're just going to watch a bunch of TV to try to just ignore what's going on. It could be a million different things. But the invitation isn't to do that. It's actually to get peace. And that happens when we go to God. The second thing is this. Pray. Duh, right? Shocking. Oh, you're surprised by that, Kaylee. Um, pray. Um, we've talked about this before, too. It says this. Uh, some of you might know this verse. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. I think this is so interesting because I, I don't know if this would have been, like, as strange of a verse a few years ago as it is now. But statistically, we are, we are part, all of us, are part of the most anxious generation there has been. That anxiety is more prevalent amongst all of us than, than has existed before. In fact, you guys experience levels of anxiety that used to be reserved for college students. So you're experiencing more anxiety at a younger age. And so when you hear something like, do not be anxious... I think that can cause us to go, is that even possible? Like, is that even realistic? How can we not be anxious? And I, and I think it's fair that, that we delineate, right, that there is this general anxiety that uh, every person sort of experiences. And then there's an anxiety that is deeper and more connected to other things, and those things probably have to be dealt with separately. I'm more going to just talk about this general anxiety today. But I don't think Paul would have written to this group of people saying, do not be anxious if anxiety wasn't something that they struggled with. Does that make sense? You don't tell somebody to not be afraid if they're not currently afraid, right? I'm not going to say, Allie, like, don't be afraid of that chair. It's not going to break. Don't even worry about it. Now you are like, oh, no, like, is there something wrong with the chair? Right? I'm not going to say that to her if the ch there isn't something wrong with the chair. In the same way, like, we're not going to say, don't be anxious if you're like, I've never been anxious a day in my life. Like, I don't have to worry about that. But the answer to not being anxious is just like, okay, don't be anxious. Just stop caring about everything. No, there's a better option. It says, but in every situation, pray. Pray that that is actually the response to go to that big God that we just talked about and to trust that he's going to take the things that are on our minds and that he's going to honor those. I think what we pray about shows what we care about. The things that we are willing to go to God with, to pray for, sh shows what we actually really care about. Because this, if we believe that God is as big as he is, that he is as powerful as he is, and that he loves us and the world, and that he wants good for us, why would we not pray? Why would we not go to him? And then the response is the same thing right again. He says, in this world you will have trouble, but you can have peace. Again, he says, when you pray, you will get a peace that surpasses understanding. That means a peace that doesn't make sense given the situation of the world. The promise isn't that all your problems will be gone, but it is that you can have peace. For grad school, I have to, because I go to grad school for this stuff, so like part of my homework is like, pray this way. Um, yeah, one, yeah, it's sometimes, depends what it is. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes I don't like it that much. Um, but one of the exercises that I had to do was called dump out your mind. Very eloquent phrase. Um, but basically what it was, was saying, hey, I don't know about you, but I'm somebody who, like, my mind goes a million hour, miles a minute. I find it really hard to pray, really hard to focus. Maybe you relate to that. And so the exercise says, what I want you to do is get a sheet of paper and write down everything that's on your mind, literally everything that you can think of, big stuff, little stuff, relationships, all that. And so I write it down, not in sentences, in bullets. And you write down till all that stuff is out of your mind, and then you go back and you pray for every single thing doesn't have to be long. It can be like 10 seconds. I just move through that list. And by the time I'm done, 
I have peace. I don't know how else to explain it. I feel more calm and more centered. Why? Because I know that the God who loves me cares about the things I care about. And I know that he heard me. And I know, I know that he's got it. And sometimes we can feel guilty, like we should pray for this big stuff, but I'm also really worried about this one little thing in my life. Pray for it all. You can have peace in all of it. And then the next thing is this, do the little things that we can. Galatians 6, 2 says, carry each other's burdens and you will fulfill the law of Christ. When we see these big problems, we can get this sense of hopelessness. Like, I can't solve this problem, I can't fix it, so I just shouldn't do anything about it. But we actually believe that, like, carrying burdens means we help in small ways. Jesus, he'll talk about the kingdom of heaven, which is, like, God's rule on the earth, like, things God's way on the earth. And he'll talk about how it looks like these tiny little seeds. That there's these small little things that don't really seem all that significant, but in the kingdom, in God's way, they matter. They're big. Listen, when we do offering and we say we're going to give the money to Ukraine, when we pray, do we think that we can single-handedly, that that money that we give is going to change the, the effects of what is going on? No, right? It's just a small drop in the bucket. But we realize that it matters. That the little thing that we do in the kingdom, that it matters. And so we do it. Not because we are big and impressive and can solve big things using our power, but because we trust a God who can. And so we do little things with great love. Jesus says that in the world you're supposed to be salt and you're supposed to be light. And I was thinking about the day, that today and I was thinking about salt. Um, and when you use salt, right, I put salt in my eggs this morning. These tiny little grains, is that grain of salt? Is that what you call it? Crystal? Grain. Okay, I'm going to stick with grain. Um, tiny little grains of salt, they fall out. Can a single grain of salt season a whole dish? Like if I put one tiny little pellet of salt in my eggs, are those going to be salty? They could. <laughs> it's really effective salt. You don't put salt in your eggs? Do you make eggs? Yeah? How do you make them? You, want, you don't want them super salty? We'll talk later. Interesting. Most do you do you put salt in your eggs? Yeah, yeah. I'm a, I got I got the crew on my side. But one little grain of salt, right? It might not be enough to season a whole dish, but we believe that that little grain of salt matters, right? That it does something, and that's who you are. You serve a big God who invites you to small things, and so we do those small things. And then the second, the last thing is this, that we do other things with great love. Galatians 6, 9 says, let us not become weary in doing good. For at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. I love that. Don't become weary in doing good. Because I think sometimes when things get complicated, when life gets hard, we can say, hey, why, why am I trying so hard? Why am I trying to be encouraging of my friends if it doesn't even make a difference? Why am I trying to do this thing right if, if it doesn't seem to really matter? And the invitation is, hey, don't grow tired of that. That's what you're called to do. Listen, we might not be able to solve the big problems of the world, but we are called to this community. You might not be able to change something else in a place where you are not, but you can change the lives of someone next to you. That's who you're called to. That's who God is calling you to. In fact, for a long time, God's plan for the world was that there was going to be this community of people. And they were going to love each other so well. And there was going to be so much justice and so much mercy and so much grace that, that other people who didn't believe in God were going to look in. And we're going to say, wait, you live like that? Who's your God? How do you do, how do, you do this? And I think we still get to live out that invitation. That we can live with the people we know here that shows the way that we want people to be treated all over the world. Just today, um, a couple days ago actually, one of my coworkers brought me a coffee because she knew that I was having a long week. I was tired, as I said earlier. 
And listen, did that coffee change the amount of pages I had to write for my paper? No, it's still the same amount. I still had to do it. But it did show this small act of love that did matter to me, right? Like the coffee wasn't going to change the, cor- uh, the course of my entire week, but in that moment it mattered. I felt loved and I felt seen. And so that's what we do. That's what we do when we don't know what to do. We go to our big God and we pray, knowing that he holds the world in his hands. And then here, we live out our calling by doing little things for big problems because we know we have a God who who takes those things and makes a difference. And then we love the people right where we are. That's what we do when we don't know what to do. As we close, I... um, Every 4th of July at my house, we invite a bunch of people over and we play volleyball. And it's really fun. But I'm not very good at volleyball. Um, Not that you're surprised by that, honestly. Um, So we get on the teams. I still get picked for a team. Don't even try to push it there. Um, Towards the end, but I still get picked. And we'll be on this team. And listen, most of the time, I'm not hitting the ball over the net. Or somebody else has to run into, like, my patch of grass to cover my area, right? They're like, you can have that zone. And it's like a little uh, slice of the the volleyball net that the ball never goes. Um, Most of the time, I'm not making a big impact. That's the point. But every once in a while, I will serve it, and it will go over the net. Yeah. And every once in a while, (laughs) thank you. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. I can show you some tips, honestly. This whole sermon was just for me to get applause about a sports-related thing, so thank you. Um, Or I'll I'll pass it to my partner so that they can set it. I think that's the phrase. Um, and And it'll work every once in a while. And you see, I'm not the star player who's going to alter the course of the game. And I don't get to decide where the sun is and whether it's in our eyes or where the ball goes or anything like that. Like, I can't control a lot, but I can. But I'm still on the team. I'm still a player. And I know that this sounds like a little cliche and a little cheesy, but you are a player on this team. And Jesus calls you to play your part. Yeah, you're not the star. He is, but you're on the team. And so you never have to feel helpless. You never have to feel like what you do doesn't matter. And you never have to have a moment when you don't know what to do. Because you have a big God that invites you to small things, and that matters. So let's do what I advised us to do. Let's pray. Jesus, we just pray um, for the state of our world right now. We pray for a war that is happening in Ukraine, and we just ask for your peace. We ask for um, your hand over that situation, Lord. And we pray for all the other things that come to mind for these students when I talk about problems that feel too big. Jesus. And we ask that you, as a big God, would come in and you would do what only you can do, Lord. Would you redeem situations that feel broken? Would you bring peace to situations that feel anxious, Lord? Would you move? Would you make a way? And then would you remind us who we are? And would you empower us to be a community who loves each other well, because we know how loved we are by you. It's in your name we pray.